Welcome back to another episode of the Say It Out Loud podcast. My name is Vasavi Kumar, your beautiful host. I'm so excited to be here with Kristen Boyce, licensed marriage and family therapist. Kristen, how are you? I am fantastic. I am so happy to be here with you. You know what? I love that. Thank you. I'm so happy that you're here with me today. It's a pleasure. I can't wait for our conversation. I know it's going to be organic, authentic, and real. And that's what people are craving in their lives. Well, let, let me just share this, okay? And I, I, I want the audience to know what you do and who you help and um, just really the essence of the work that you do. When I hear, when I was in my uh, master's in social work, I remember that I had the opportunity to become LMFT. Like I could have got, gone down that path. And I so wanted to because I had spent so much of my childhood trying to um, heal my parents' marriage, which is why I went into social work in the first place. You know, I thought like, oh, I'm just so good at therapizing because I've been doing it since the age of four. Uh, and I never became an LMFT, the licensed marriage and family therapist, but I love talking about relationships with people more than anything, especially because I just turned 40. I'm very open to love. I'm not seeking it, but I'm open to it, if that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. So I'd love for the audience to know because, you know, they may hear our conversation and then be like, man, I need Kristen in my life, right? They may need to work with you. Maybe they have some stuff that they want to sort out in their own um, marriage, in their own family, in their own relationships. So how do you work with people? What do you do? Tell us, the, you know, you're, you're the, the, the best part of what you do and how you help people. So the best part of what I do and the privilege I get to walk through is help people free themselves mm -hmm. from beliefs and conditioning and unhealthy relationships. Many of us watched our parents mm -hmm. have unhealthy relationships and not only with themselves, but with each other. And sometimes with us, you know, you, you took on what we call the technical term, the parentified child. Me and my sister, both of us, we both did in our own way. Yeah, we did. Yeah. And you thought, okay, I can make this. I see everything. I see how you two are interacting with each other. I see the dynamic and I can come in and kind of help see both sides and want to make it better, bring peace to the family system. I love systems work. That's what I do. What is a system? A system is made up of multiple people, layers, conditions, dynamic cultures, and they all play a role with each other. So when I'm working with a client, I'm not just working with the individual. I'm working with the system they came from and the systems in which they came from. We have multiple systems we've come from. That's why I love um, being a marriage and family therapist because it really gets to the heart of the matter. It gets to the root of the issue. How did we become who we are? That's what started me in this whole career. My mom was a therapist. So I grew up being psychoanalyzed by my mother and she really probably, God bless her, love her, but really probably therapy wasn't necessarily her healthiest outlet for herself. She was trying to get her needs met by being a therapist. And we all start off trying to get some needs met, you know, that unmet needs from childhood, but she was really kind of playing that dynamic out, trying to get her needs met. And that's what's happening relationally. We're trying to get needs met. We don't even know we're trying to get these needs met, but we all have these unmet needs. We come in thinking this is because we've watched movies. We've seen what we think, oh, romantic love is. We've seen Disney and we think, oh, we're just soulmates. And then we'll just know like there won't be any conflict and we're just going to have this harmonious relationship. Well, the couples that don't fight ever, I'm most concerned about because they've buried and suppressed everything. So what I do is I come in and I connect in an authentic way with the client so they can be honest and real and tell me the truth about what's really going on in their lives, maybe even for the first time. Because we're not allowed to tell the truth in a lot of times in our childhood. There's a price to pay. There's a discipline. There's a relationship that's pulled from you. So you learn to kind of not tell the truth. Or when you do tell the truth, it's not really celebrated. It's you're too much. You're too intense. You're too sensitive. You're too emotional. And so we stifle parts of ourselves. And so what I love to do is inner child work. And I know you talk about this and you talked about it on my podcast and it's what I'm most passionate about because those are the parts that we bring into relationships that we're trying to heal through the relationship. 
Okay, so in, 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 I will say this. I, as I'm listening to you, I'm like, yes, preach. And as a host, you know, I have full control over this. Not full control, but I get to, I, oh, yes, I do. I get, to, I get to choose a direction that I want this to go. You, you know, usually, and I said this to you, I have a set of questions that I ask, but I actually want to toss out all those questions because I'm like, you know what? I think for this conversation, and I know so many people listening, you know, whenever I work with someone, and I know you know this too, I work with women and men who are great professionally. They, they feel great professionally in the one area of their life, and it's so odd to me, but not. They come to me and, you know, they're struggling in their friendships. They're struggling in their relationships. And so I really want to highlight the work that you do with people. And I'm thinking to myself, what direction do I want to go in here? Um, I love the idea of the parentified child. Um, one of the things that I realized, Kristen, is, you know, as I kind of retired my therapist hat, because I had to I had to get real with myself. And I realized that I chose the path of therapy because I had been playing therapist to my parents. So I, you know, asked myself, if I could do it all over again, would I have been a therapist? And absolutely not. I wouldn't have. I'm just going to be really honest. I don't regret it. I don't regret it. I want to make that very clear for any of my clients who have ever worked with me. I don't regret working with you. It's not none of that. But I had to be real with myself and ask myself, did I, did I choose this path because I really wanted to be a therapist or did I just... Was it, is, was it how I coped my whole life? Is I played the role of therapist to keep the peace. Do you find that with your clients who come in that w like one or both of them played the role of the parentified child growing up? And are they doing that in their relationship? Absolutely. A hundred percent. And the reason why I'm asking, of course, I'm going to make this about me because hello, I'm, I have you here. I'm going to pick your brain. In my relationships that I've been in, I have, I have attracted men in my life who always make me feel no I have the similar feeling when I'm with them as how I felt with my dad which is I need to save you I need to save you dad I need to protect you dad and so that that's where I'm at in my life is and I realize like no one wants to fuck their therapist right like if I'm playing therapist to these men no one wants to so that I'm at a place now where I'm like no I'm you know I'm not here to save you I'm not here to rescue you so yeah t sh share with us because I want what I want here is for you listening everyone listening right now maybe this is you maybe you play this in your romantic relationships or even at work or with your colleagues right always picking up the slack for everyone else or in your friendships so yeah how does this show up with some of your clients I would say in most couple dynamics, you have a one parentified child and I call it the parent adult relationship where one person feels like the parent, the other person feels like the kid emotionally. And maybe there's some, you know, household things and, and such, but it's really deeper than that. It's where you feel like you are, want them to save, fix, or rescue them. You, you, the, the person in the relationship wants to fix, save, or rescue. And it's not even a conscious thought. Like it's not even a conscious thought going into it because people are like, well, I didn't think like, oh, I want to fix, rescue, or save you. No, you don't. It's literally an energy. It's like a feeling of like, oh, let me, oh my God, you poor puppy. It's let like, help you. Mm -hmm. And they'll go in and they do these relationships because they see potential in the person. And I'm like, run for the hills. Not that we don't all have potential, but we think that, that if we just get them to see the light, then they're going to be this partner that I really want. That's going to be engaged, loving, acknowledging, emotionally available, mature when they didn't get it themselves in their childhood. So we pick people. To, to use your kind of how you were like, oh, I picked my father in a way. Mm -hmm. And not that your dad doesn't have wonderful characteristics because he does, but the dynamic between you and your dad is what you went for. It's the dynamic. It's I will be the caretaker. Does that make sense? Emotionally, I will be the caretaker emotionally because mom and dad's relationship was he looking, who was looking for the caretaking to be taken care of emotionally? Well, your parent. thank you for asking. I, I'm getting a free therapy session and hopefully everyone else is, um, is benefiting from this too. But I, I think this is great because if y'all, you know, if you want to work on this, you can actually just see us almost in a way having our own little mini session if you're okay with that, Kristen. And then if you like this, then, then definitely check out Kristen's website, hire her, work with her, all the things. Um, in my family growing up, my mother was uh, emotionally very dysregulated. She was very volatile and angry. And... Um, 
And I branded her as the bad parent. I don't do that at all. I've actually, I'm very happy to say I've healed my relationship with my mother. It's my first time ever saying that. I've been saying that a lot. Like, wow, like I have healed that relationship with my mother and um, it feels beautiful. But my mom was the more verbally explosive one. My father just kept very quiet. And so as a kid, I was scared of my mother and I felt bad for my dad. But I, as I've gotten older, I... I've um, I've had to work through anger towards my father because it was like, what the heck? Why didn't you stand up for me? I had to stand up for my him and myself. So I became the bad kid because I would yell back at my mother. So I became the disrespectful child. And um, yeah, it was like me and my dad against my mom. Yeah, yeah. you almost became the protector for yeah. your dad, mm -hmm. right? With your mom's words, you were protecting him and you, but the passivity of your dad. He was a, pa my father, listen, I, I, I speak about my dad openly and I, I will not, even to this day, I'm not going to uh, bad mouth him or I'm not angry with him. I see things for how they are now, but he, um, he didn't really have much of a backbone. Um, and in fact, when I would say to him, why don't you just leave her? I said this at the age of like eight or nine, I would, I actually said to my, my father, leave the bitch. I said, leave the bitch. I was so angry. I internalized so much of my mother's anger, which I've had to work through my own anger. But I would say to my father, leave her. And my father would say, no, she's gone through so much in her life. She just needs love. And so then when I started, when I got married, or after I got married and then divorced, I picked men and I would test them to see how much of me can you handle. So I would always be sweet and syrupy at, in the beginning. And then little by little, I would, you know, once you start pissing me off, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to explode. Oh, do you, okay. So you're going to stay around even if I get angry? Oh, you must love me. Okay. I'm going to show you, you know, so it was always testing because I thought love meant never leaving somebody, no matter how explosive or angry they got. Cause I saw wow. my dad do that. Yeah. That's in this. You're like fascinated by this. You like live for this work. You're like, yeah. I love it. I live for it because what happens is the more yeah. self-aware we are, which are very self-aware. So yeah. this makes it easier. So I guess. I think yeah. to connect dots is when you're willing to like connect, you're willing to go there. Yeah. So you're not threatened by that. There's a sense of um, so much connection to your process. Mm -hmm. And I think it's beautiful for people to see that because they see that as confident Mm -hmm. They see that as ability to, to voice what you need. And that's because you're so self-aware. Yes. I think you already have this also tenacious side to you and you express that like in your childhood, but I definitely think self-awareness, like you being self-aware is what I want to highlight mm -hmm. research shows the most successful people and the greatest leaders. This is very interesting is self-awareness. So yeah. in a relationship, when I work with couples, the challenge we have is one person wants to be self-aware and work, wants to do all this and the other person doesn't. Yeah, I have so much to say about that. And you know what I realized? It's like, I'm not God and I'm not here to wake you up. I'm not here to wake you up. I mean, but it, it's, it's a very, in my romantic relationship, I don't want that in my romantic relationship. I want someone who can meet themselves as deeply as I've met myself. I want someone who has no shame or pride in saying, yeah, I fucked up. Yeah, like, yeah, I made a mistake. Like, who who knows that owning your flaws and owning your mistakes doesn't make you small, right? It actually shows a sign of strength. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where I'm at right now. So I'm, I'm very careful about who I've, I'm allowing in. Because you want someone to be self-aware enough to take radical ownership and have a growth mindset to say, oh, I can see where I, I, re where I really have room to kind of heal that part of me. And I'll tell you why that's important, Kristen, is because growing up as a kid, right? And I want everyone hearing this. For those of you who end up taking all the responsibility as a child, I took one for the team. I said, you know what? Yell at me, hit me, say that I'm the bad one. I just need you two to get along. So I took one for the team always. Like I didn't, I was okay being the one with the temper tantrums. Okay, I'll be the, okay. At least the focus is on me and at least you guys will stop fighting. And so what ends up happening, what ended up happening is that I would end up in my relationships taking all the responsibility and then that, per it's always my fault. And, but as I got older, it's like, no, that's just, I, I started waking up and I'm like, no, that's not fair. And that's when my resentment started to build. So everyone listening right now, this next part, what we want to, what I want to get into, Kristen, is really how can we, for people who are just starting to, or they're already waking up to the fact that like, oh man, I'm definitely recreating my childhood. Um, 
what are some signs for people to look for? Because I know, you know, at, at the end of the day, we all want to be loved and we all want to love, right? So what is, what are some things that we can look for if we're wanting to see if we are recreating patterns from childhood and how that's showing up? Yeah. The first thing yeah. I would really work with people on is being real about your own family dynamic because people come into childhood or come into therapy, especially if had, they've had emotional neglect and like, I had a wonderful childhood. Oh, the minute someone says that, I'm like, bro, you're fucked up. Like if you don't, if you think that everything was Disneyland growing up and everything, it's like, no, then like either you are in complete denial. No, actually that's it. You're in complete denial. That's it. And a lot of times we think that emotional neglect or neglect has to be this like awful thing. But like even, even saying things like, oh, I love you if you do this, even that is neglectful. Or, or you'll be even better if you do this. Like even that is, 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 is reemphasizing that narrative of you're not worthy as you are right now. If only you just did this. Is that kind of what you see? Is like, yeah, like I mean, if you if you do well, if you perform well, if you get straight A's, if you're the athlete, if you, mm -hmm. you know, keep the peace, if you comply, if you're the compliant child. If you're obedient. My sister is known as the obedient child. Yeah. Exactly. And those are the ones in my office, the compliant kids. <laughs> those are the ones in my office going, I don't know who I am. I am lost. I don't know myself. I'm afraid of what people think of me. They're people pleasers. They're what we call in the therapy world codependent where my worth is based on what, how you feel this day or how you feel about me. Um, they're riddled with shame of feeling not good enough. And I think there's some red flags and here's the red flags in terms of, and this isn't to blame parents. I want to make sure I'm very clear on that because they did the best they could with how they were raised and the examples they got and the information they had. It's important that we can be real and honest about how um, we were raised. So for example, with my husband, two months into dating, I was like, we're going to premarital counseling. <laughs> he's, he's like, I think I love you. I'm like, and let's get, I wanted to get it all on the table. Wait, we are, we, and hold on. You guys were dating. 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 I love that. So I can do that. I'm going to do that. If you listen, oh, game changer. if you love me and you want to be with me, this is the requirement. Yeah. And he was like, okay. He didn't know what he was signing up for. He'd never been to therapy in his life. Mm -hmm. I was like, let's get into our patterns. I want to understand the relationship with your mom, your dad, siblings, um, extended family. Like, let's get on, on the, your past patterns with previous relationships. Like, what were they? What were your, what, what were your triggers? Where did you feel stuck? We got it all out on the table. It was the best investment we ever made. And the reason why I knew he was the one, I mean, when we say the one, but we're, I could see a life with him because he was willing. There was a willingness to say, yeah, I can look at this. It's not a threat to me. I'm not doing it to please you. I really want to go and I want to explore this. And he grew up in a family where they would just yell and scream and get it out and then be like, pass the potatoes. And that's how he grew up. I grew up from a divorce family. My parents got divorced when I was eight. We each bring things into the relationship and people have to recognize that from our past. I, we bring things into a relationship and we have to be talking about this. Do you know that I was, um, this is, see, this is, and this is why everyone listening, it's so important that you do your own work. So you're not gaslighting yourself or continuing to be gaslit or having the cloak over your eyes. And I would love to hear your thoughts on this, Kristen. I was talking to an ex of mine and my ex fiance. We didn't talk for about a month and a few weeks. I needed that space. It was a big month for me. I had turned 40. My magazine cover came out. I just wanted to celebrate myself without the drama. And there was a, there was a lot of pain with him. Um, because it, it was, you know, lack of consistency. And anyway, long story long, um, him and I spoke and we were just talking very friendly about conflict. And I said, you know, I don't think conflicts and like repairing, like for me, repairing is the most important part because I, important part, I never saw my parents repairing. I saw my mother blowing up, screaming, throwing something, walking out of the house, me pacifying my dad, then her coming home, it being silent for hours, and then going to sleep, feeling anxious, and next day, everything was fine. 
And I'm like, what the fuck? When did this get better? How do we make this better, right? So I never saw the repairing piece, which is why I think I got, I, I worked so hard to repair. Like, can we talk about this? Can we say it out loud, right? That's where my book comes from, is from telling my parents from a young age to say it out loud. So I was talking to my ex, right? And he was saying that, you know, when two people argue, like, it, you know, why can't we just say like, you know what, we're done talking about this and just move on. I go, uh... So you just want to say we're done and move on and then, okay. And I asked him, so when do we close the loop? When do we repair? He goes, what's there to talk about? Just, we'll just move on. And I go, well, I, I'm like, oh my God. And I didn't take it personally. I realized like, oh man, that's really what you saw. You saw. Exactly. Exactly. Because where does it come from? That's the question we need to be asking. And then what part are you talking to when you talk to it? let's say just this example, are you talking to his adaptive child, the part that we adapted to our environment? And this is what we do. We just kind of brush it under the rug and we go on and we don't talk about it. That's the majority of people. And you, you being able to go, Oh, where did that come from? Oh, I don't need to take that personally because that's what he learned. That, and, and that, for, that is taken. And that is why I've let go. It, like emotionally, I have Feel, I have felt that letting go because it's not personal anymore. It's never personal. I don't take it as, you don't want to talk about stuff because you don't love me. It's like, no, you don't want to talk about stuff because you literally don't know how. It's a skill that you have not learned. It's a relational skill that you haven't learned. So all I said to him was, um, he asked me, he's like, well, how do you, like, what does repairing look like for you? I go, for me, it is simple as, hey, I am so sorry for what I said. I am so sorry for what I did. Here's what I want to do moving forward. I love you. I'm sorry. Give me a hug. Give me a kiss. And that's it. It, it. I don't believe, I believe that to repair things for me, like, Kristen, I just need acknowledgement because I can't be taken on 100%, even if it's 90-10. Even if it's 80, 20, I was just talking about this with my, with my friend yesterday and she was giving me these percentages. I need you to be responsible for something. If you can't see that there's anything that you could have done differently, I can't be in a relationship with you because I'm going to bear the burden of everything all the time. Yeah. You're going to be the parentified child. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. That's That's the example of how it plays out. So if we look at the parentified child and we go, what does that actually look like? Like, what are you really saying? You just gave a great example. The parentified child takes on the burden of all of it rather than the parents taking on their part and owning their part. The parentified child takes it all on of what's not being processed and acknowledged in the room. Do you know my my older sister and I, I only have one sister. She's like my best friend. We speak every day. The majority of our conversations are about our mother. And I said to her the other day, I go, I said to my sister, we got to talk about something else because she is who she is. I said, you will, you are not the source of her happiness. I said to my sister, no matter what you do, you cannot make someone happy. You can only, you know, do as much as you can. You know what I mean? I go, but you are not responsible for her happiness. And I just, I want my sister to get to that point where she stops thinking that she's God in a way, you know, in a way she's placed herself as like, I am the one. And I'm like, you are so not the one. Be the one for yourself. Be the one for your kids up until a point until they got to be the one. For, like, you know what I mean? Like, you stop trying to be the one. Um, so I see that a lot with my sister. I'm definitely lucky. And I think it's because I have physical distance from my parents. I don't live with them. But when you're working with someone, okay, someone comes to you. They've identified themselves as a parentified child. What do they do? How? What, what do they do to stop being that way? Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, it's a journey. I wish it was a one, two, three step. I know. I know. You know? It is an everyday moment to moment. It it is. And when you are self-aware enough, like for example, like you talking about your sister or you even like when you go home or when you're around your family system, people are like, I've done all this work. And then I'm right there in my eight-year-old self. I'm like, yep. And just breathe, noticing and creating pause between how you respond For example, with your mom, if your mom is dysregulated and Mm -hmm. your sister feels responsible for taking care of her, I know so many listeners right now are like, that's me. I feel responsible for my parents' happiness and I don't want to upset them. I don't want to make them upset or mad or trigger them. So I don't bring anything up. They don't say it out loud to pull in your book title. Mm -hmm. They don't say it out loud because they're afraid of their reaction. And when you can tolerate their reaction, when you can start tolerating that they're going to be upset and you're okay. You're growing up. You grow up. 
that's that they have to self-soothe and my kids will say don't say self-soothe but i'm like it's the essence of the work i mean when we can self-soothe yes we soothe in relationship too that's not what i'm saying i'm not saying you just you're in silo but you're able then to soothe that little girl inside or the little human inside of you and say you know what that isn't your job anymore that never was your job you you did it and you did a fine job growing up and now you don't have to do that anymore. It isn't your job. And if she's going to be upset, I know it's hard. Take a deep breath. And so we're releasing what's trapped in our nervous system because we feel that tension in our body that we have to make it right. We have to make it better. We have to create the peace and harmony. Otherwise, they're going to be this disharmony between us. Like mom's going to be upset with me and I can't handle it. Here's the kicker that I think I work with a lot of clients on. I will say, is it preventing you from being in the relationship romantically that you want to be in because your energy is going towards your mother mm -hmm. or is it taking away from you being the parent that you want to be because your mom's gotten you so, or your parent, whoever has gotten you so upset that now you are almost, you're trying to self-preserve. And when you're parenting, you're no longer being able to parent. You can be the best parent you can be because you're so upset about how, how mom's upset or whomever is upset or you're in a relationship and you take that at that dynamic and it just it's like a leaky boat into your relationship so we start healing by naming it because when we deny it we can't heal it so that's the bottom line we know that's a defense that's pretty strong in family systems and when parents deny their own emotions when parents deny the reality of the dynamics it makes it hard for the child's not going to find healing right because they're they're not acknowledging the truth so the first part of our my work is people starting to tell the truth and tolerating that it's okay we're not saying you have a bad parent we're not making the parent terrible that you can tolerate saying this is the reality of my dynamic in my family system we're coming out of denial in the defense system we're looking at attachment which we know there's anxious attachment secure attachment avoidant attachment and the a great book is called attached that mm -hmm. i i recommend but we're looking at how did my parents show up was it inconsistent were they emotionally available meaning that when I was upset, I was allowed to be upset. I was allowed to cry. No, I mean, it was always, we walked on eggshells around my mother. Uh, I could tell just by, I think I shared this maybe on your podcast, um, just even how she put her keys down. We knew she was upset. So then I know exactly how to be. I can, ooh, okay, just kind of, okay, get together. And then, you know, just that's just how I was. I just know how to get it together. Uh, hyper vigilant. Um, and with my dad, you know, he's tired and I just wanted to melt in my dad's arms. And, uh, you know, and then when my mom came home, it'd be like, oh, here we go. You know, it was just, so there's never really any predictability. Um, but it's, uh, I have forgiven both of them for sure. I'm not angry with either one of them, but I have zero tolerance. So when my mom wants to complain about my dad, you know, I, I, I jokingly say, y'all, it's been 47 years. Come on, enough. And I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. I just flat out say, and then I, I, I do feel a little bit guilty when I say it because, oh, it's my job to listen. It's my, I'm being selfish. And I'm like, hell no. But I think my mom, you know, we're just honest with each other. I say to my mom, I, I can't listen to it anymore. There's nothing I can do. You guys chose to stay married for 47 years. You should have done like me and left your husband after three years. Because after three years, you know, I knew I was done with this guy. I left. I go, don't, I don't want to hear it. And you know what? I've had to work through my feelings of guilt because uh, I feel guilty that I'm not, you know, that I I, I should be listening to you. But I, I, I just, I don't anymore. You don't, don't have it in you. you I don't. I you literally don't do not have the bandwidth. You don't have it in you. And so that forces us to have what we call boundaries. What's okay, what's not okay. What you're going to tolerate anymore. And you're like, you know what? This is between you two. This is why I coach people to say all the time. You're getting triangulated in, which is really meant for two parties. So it's mom and dad and they pull you into the middle, that is called triangulation. And that is one of the most, I would say, pervasive patterns that we take. And we do it to friendships. We do it in work environments. We do it all the time. And it's like, no, when that's our adaptive child online. That is not our healthy, wise adult. When we can say, you know what, that's between you two, and that has nothing to do with me, and I'm not going to have this conversation any longer. It's it's scary at first. I work with clients like, oh my gosh, they look at me with deer and headlights. Like I could not say that. I'm like, well, we're going to try it on. 
and we're going to say it out loud and we're <laughs> going to be able to work through on the back end the feelings of guilt and shame and fear and so we can build up our window of tolerance to be like no that's what healthy looks like well let me tell you this another added piece and i don't know if you share, share, this, share this with your clients but i think i know for me the and a lot of my clients the hardest part is you know if setting those boundaries, I, I, I believe our worst fear is that we're going to be alone, right? Like being alone, being ostracized. And that's why I tell everyone to learn to be comfortable with yourself. Because when you learn to love your own solitude, it's like, I, I, this is how I've gotten myself to a point where it's like, I would rather set a boundary and lose you than not set a boundary and hate myself, period. And for me, it's like, well, I got me. I'm good with me. You know what I mean? So it's like, I tell whether you're partnered or not partnered, you have to learn to be okay alone because you might get to a situation where someone cuts you off. And what's keeping you in that relationship is you're afraid of being cut off. And so it's like, get cut off, but at least he got you. Right. And I don't think it has to get to that point where it has to be. So, you know, oh, people cut people off, but I think we stay in relationships and we don't express our boundaries because we are afraid of people being mad and then, oh, we're going to be alone. It's like, learn to love yourself so much that with or without you, I'm okay. I know that sounds callous, but don't you, do you agree? You don't have to agree with me, but don't you think that- I agree hundred percent. Thank you so yeah. much. I love when people agree with me hundred percent. Okay, keep going. <laughs> keep going, yeah. You're, you're, you have a, secure, a security within yourself. That's the ultimate goal of therapy. The okay. ultimate goal of therapy is love and I know it sounds so cliche, but really embracing all the parts of you, the ones that you really don't like, the parts that are that give like bring shame to you that you're like, no, I'm okay. Like I'm okay with all these parts. Now, one of the biggest struggles I think for people in being okay with themselves is they're stuck at a certain age. Mm -hmm. And, and do you find that, and I want to go to that, but do you find that, that, um, as you get, like, there are different times in your life where you have to, where you get to address different ages that you've been stuck in. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And so this has been the year that I have such good girlfriends and I've had to heal the 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old in me that had girlfriends that backstabbed me, girlfriends that gossiped about me. I used to lie to my girlfriends. I didn't want to, or I would, I, I had a big mouth and I would share secrets and I, I had to, I, I wasn't always the best friend, right? Like, so I've been able to cultivate such beautiful girlfriends that I'm able to share my shame with them about stuff that I would never tell um, because I've healed that teenager, 20 year old. So like, yeah, I would love for you to speak more on that. Yeah, exactly. You nailed it. And when you can identify, like I can know what part of me is like online. So in relationships, yeah. this is key in relationships. It, typically we will, we will partner with someone developmentally at the same level as we are at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Keep going. I'm loving this. Yeah. So you're drawn to these because you're at the same developmental level. And then once you start working on some of these parts, you're going to see if the other person isn't, you feel like you're outgrowing the other person. Okay. Mm -hmm. and we want to get this person to do the same growth work. And we're like, so, you know, in couples therapy, they'll bring they they really say they want the work, but they want me to really heal, fix the other partner. Mm -hmm. And so when you can start identifying, the key is asking yourself, how old do I feel right now? Because typically when you're in conflict with a partner, a child, a friend, it's a younger part. It's not your wise adult part that's getting hijacked or activated. It's a younger part. And when you start working with that part and you start nurturing that part, and I know we talked about it on, on my podcast, mm -hmm. you nurturing that part of you. You're not dependent on getting that from the other person to have worth and value and significance. You're able to do that for yourself. That's the journey, ever going journey in my life that will continue. It's not like you hit the, you hit the end finish line and you'll never have to do this again. No, my younger parts still get, get activated and I then know what they need. What do they need? They need nurturing. What do they need? They need an acknowledgement. What do they need? They need space to process and share, whether that's on paper or calling a friend or going to therapy. It needs to be witnessed. I love Peter Levine's quote where trauma is the lack of an empathic witness. It's not what happens to you. It's the lack of an empathic witness. When you can be that for yourself, you can offer it to others. And then you offer that in your relationship. So when two people do the work, that's the recipe. 
I, I, it's the recipe for when self-awareness and you can name what's going on. So I work with couples and there's a willingness to do that. It's incredible, but you have to be willing to do it with yourself. Like this whole arrested development. If you start drinking at, let's say someone starts drinking at 12, they're emotionally 12. And so when people like meet each other and there are some behaviors, they might be with the 12 year old and not realize it emotionally, if that makes sense. They, they might be picking mm -hmm. someone that's stuck. So I have a question for you. Um, what do you do when, I'm just asking for a friend, Kristen, uh, what do you do when you, no, I'm, I, I'm, no, I'm, you know what, this is my podcast. I'm going to be honest because I want to embody what I teach. I'm asking this for myself, but I know a lot of people are going through this right now, just in conversation. Okay. So what happens or like, what do you make of this? If you've healed a lot of the parts of yourself, you're feeling good. You know what, Vasavi? I got to talk to myself real quick. I'm going to own this. I'm going to own this. Let me just let me just ask you. I um, feel like I've outgrown this person that I loved so much. OK, I loved I, and I still love him very much. But I it's like I the way that I love him is the it's like it's the same feeling that I have for my father. And that's how I know this is not healthy because when I look into his eyes, when I am around him, I feel sadness. I feel powerlessness. I feel helplessness. Like I can't save you, right? Cause you're still drinking. You're still occasionally using drugs and I'm not there, dude. I'm not there. I cleaned up my life. And like, even, you know, even if I, you know, want to, you know, eat an edible, it doesn't like take over my life. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, um, my life is not unmanageable like it used to be, right? Cause I cleaned up my life. I got sober. And so I feel, but I'm at a place now where I, I have, it feels like emotionally outgrown this person. And so when I'm with this person, just even as friends, I still have a deep love for this person, but I feel like he's bringing stuff to the conversation that's so, uh, I feel like I'm gonna sound judgy when I say this. It's so uh, rudimentary. It's like, oh, what kind of rug should I get? Or how do I do this? And I'm like, are you asking me adulting questions right now? And then a part of me feels like, oh, I should support this person because they're trying to grow up. Let me be there for them. But I don't want to fuck you. I'm going to be honest. Like, I don't feel like fucking the guy who, who 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 needs me to, like, make decisions for them. Like, it feels very parentified for me. Why are you, you know? So that's where I, you know, I, I struggle with sometimes because it's like, I love you. I, I love you. I have love for you, right? But it's like... I guess I'm outgrowing the type of love that I had for this person. It's no longer romantic because that part of me that loved you, I've grown up from. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You're telling me that I no longer, like that no longer feels connective to you. And maybe it yeah. never did. You yeah. just didn't recognize it. And you're like, I don't want more of that in my life. I want deeper depths. I want deeper dives. I want more emotional connection where we can be vulnerable about what we feel and less on the surface. I want to feel fascinated by you. I want to feel inspired by you. I want to, I want to be better because of you. And I've never had a single person in my life romantically where I want to be better for them. I've always been the one that's like, look, I'm getting better. Follow my lead. We can be great together, right? I've never had the other way around. Um, and that's what I'm looking for. And I'm calling that in. I, in fact, I was with the, with the, with the, group of friends yesterday, we were doing these little like quest for love dating cards. And they asked me like, what are you calling in for love in this season of your life? And I was like, ah, oh, do we have to talk about that? Let's talk about money. Let's talk about business. And they're like, no Voss, you, you're a coach. You need to sit with the discomfort. Come on, answer this question. And that's what I said. I go, I want someone where it's easy. And I, I said, I'm allowed to want that, right? It can be easy, right? It doesn't have to be a drawn out therapy session. It doesn't have to be these mundane conversations. And I feel guilty, ow. I feel guilty even saying that out loud, but that's why I'm saying it out loud more. So y'all, I'm, you know, walking the talk here and telling you, it's like, if I if I don't say it, I, I keep it inside, I feel guilty. But when I say it, I notice, oh, I feel guilty saying this. But then the more I share it, the less I feel guilty, the more I start to own what I want. Yes, yes. That's what I want. I want a man who I'm fascinated by. Like, you know, I, I want you to be amazing at what you do. What I, I don't care what you do, but be amazing at it and be passionate about it. I want you to be alive. I don't want to be your life force anymore because I was my father's life force. Yes. I was. You want someone to inspire you and help you grow 
just as much as you do. You don't want to be the only life force for someone. You want it a mutual. Yeah. Hearing. You want mutual. So for everyone listening right now, if you're looking to call in love in your life, so Kristen, I would love to hear from you. How do you, what, what would you say to my audience right now? You know, people who are maybe they're in a marriage that they are not sure if they want to be in or in a relationship, or they're like me, they're single and they've been doing the damn thing on themselves internally and they are ready. Like, here's the thing. I'm not chasing after. I'm not on dating apps, nothing. I got, I got bigger fish to fry than to be swiping on. I can't do it. You know, I don't want to. It's, it's such a waste of my energy, to be honest. For me personally, it's exhausting. Um, but w- what would you say to the person who's like wanting to call in love, but they're, you know, it's just, they don't even know where to begin. Like, what should we be looking out for? Or should we just chill? Like, what do we, what do we do? Yeah. I think that is what so many people want. They want that love. They want the love that they help. Well, we know successful relationships are the ones that you help each other grow. Those are the ones that last forever because there's constantly a connection of deeper growth. That is what people want, I think, ultimately. Yeah, Yeah, the the sex follows and all the wonderful things we want. But the way we get it, and this is going to sound like, oh, Crested, is this really going to be the advice? I'm here for it. Yeah, what is it? It has to be a willingness to take a look at the timeline of your life. You cannot, and I believe this, source what you want without looking at the timeline of your life. What does that mean? I want people to write out what age they are, like age significant life events that happened. It can be positive or not so positive. And you're going to write out like, what age were you? What impact did it have on you? What belief do you have about yourself? Because that's what plays out in blocking you from sourcing, Mm. seeing a healthy, secure person when they come into your sphere. Otherwise you're going to be like, they're boring. They're this, we, we rationalize them away where when we've done our own work, we're like, Oh, that's sexy. That's I like that. That feels enlivening to me. That feels exciting. That feels passionate because they are functioning from the same place you are. You see, now you're sourcing someone's same developmental level, but it's a secure level versus an anxious or an avoidant person. And we only can do that when you've done enough self-exploration to have the insight. And then you will be able to spot the red flags. I have lots of people I work with. And they're like, I saw it. I saw that they couldn't communicate that they don't know how to communicate. And they, I can't do that. And I'm like, okay, notice it. How does it feel in your nervous system? I don't, it doesn't feel good. feels like I'm back into trying to communicate with my parents or with my ex. And I'm like, okay, there's your answer. Your answer lies within you when you connect to your nervous system and Mm -hmm. you listen to it. And when you stop, um, when you stop, I, 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 I say this to all my clients, when you stop gaslighting yourself, stop telling yourself that how you feel isn't real, right? Like trust that part of you, like things that used to be, I used to be like, oh, well, maybe if I was just less this, I'm like, fuck that noise. Hell no, I'm good. I'm good. You don't know how to communicate. I can see that. I can feel it. No, thank you. I, you know, we could be friends, but from a distance, like that's, I'm at that point now because it's like, you know, 40 years of, of, of denying your truth and gaslighting yourself. It's like, it, 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 you know, at some point you, you gotta be willing to stop doing that to yourself. Stop abusing yourself. Right. Um, it's, and, and start saying things out loud to people when you date, like people are like, well, I don't want them to think I'm too much. I'm like, no, I interviewed my husband the first date. I was like, I'm not playing around here. I, I don't, I don't want to get into another bad relationship. I interviewed him first date. I asked him about his family history. I asked him about well, his mom and dad. I asked him about previous relationships. And if I'm too much, then it's okay. I'd rather know now on the first if, date. If you can't handle, if someone cannot handle the depth of those questions or isn't willing, you're not my person because exactly. my person, my person isn't scared to look at themselves. Bingo. Bingo. My and person come to the table very, when people are like, well, I'm not going to ask that question. I'm like, well, then you're going to find out six months later and be like, oh, I don't really want to be with them. And I'm like, yeah, because you weren't willing to get uncomfortable. You weren't willing to get uncomfortable and step into that fear of losing the person. Cause to your point, you don't want to be alone. I said, you're going to feel alone because this isn't going to be the match for you. So asking questions out of the gate, I cannot emphasize that enough. Ask questions out of the gate with curiosity. You don't have to be interrogating. You're just curious because if somebody can't communicate or is uncomfortable with emotions, chances are that's going to be a very rocky relationship. 
Okay, so I want to end with two questions, okay? Kristen, uh, what is something that you encourage anyone listening right now who's in a relationship or wanting to get into a relationship? What is something that you want to encourage my audience to say more of out loud? Oh, that's a great question. Ooh, how they feel. So I feel, and you've got to, you, you've got to do the rumble of what you feel. People are, don't know because they're not taking the time to connect with what they feel. And when you say how you feel out loud, there's transformation that takes place because mm -hmm. we're not repressing it. We're not having it be a leaky boat and you're displacing your anger onto somebody else. It's really not about them. It's about your anger with mom or whomever. You're actually processing in real time what you feel. That is powerful. That is powerful. You're not displacing it onto somebody else. So you mindfully say, I feel, you say how you feel. And that is life changing. You say it out loud. So people, we, we've got to break the cycle on family systems that don't say how they feel. It's, you will not be able to have a healthy relationship without it, period. period. Blank, blank. You won't. <laughs> they come into my office and I'm like, it takes me hours sometimes to pull things out of people because it was not safe to say how they felt in their family system. They don't know how they feel because they've been the parentified child and they've been trying to caretake everybody else. There is power in knowing yourself. That will lead you to the right partner. I tell people this all the time. I'm like, just, I promise. And like, but, but I'm afraid of being alone for the rest of my life. That Maybe you need to stop finding a relationship and build one with yourself first. No. Oh my God. I had someone that was like, I really just want a relationship. And I was like, the fact that you want one so bad tells me that you do not have one with yourself. You, I, listen, I'm open to love, but you know what? And I've had this conversation with God out loud. If I died alone in this house that I live in, I would be okay. I, I honestly believe that. I know my dog's going to die soon. She's 12. Well, knock on wood. Hopefully she won't, but she's a golden, you know, she's hip dysplasia, all this Precious. stuff. Oh my God, love her. But I've, I've come to like, and I'm okay with it. I, I like, I genuinely believe that like, if I were to be alone for the rest of my life and die alone, would I be okay? And I said, yes. And I did that new in my recovery. I didn't believe it at first, but now I'm like, yeah, if I'm alone, I mean, I have great friends, my family's, you know, around and whatever, but if it's just me and me, I'm okay with just me and me. So that makes me less thirsty, exactly. less, less desperate. And, that, and by the way, for all my business owners, Heal the relationship with yourself, your own codependency. That shit will affect you and your business so positively, right? Because when it comes to clients, if you don't want to work with me, that's fine. You don't want to renew with me, that's fine. Okay, no problem. You don't want to join my program. I don't, I am not here to overcome your objections and help you fix. No, I'm done doing that. I, you know, you know, in business, they say that with sales objections. Yes, please clap. Like helping your clients overcome objections. No, no means no. If someone doesn't want to work with you, they don't want to work with you. If someone were to say, I don't want to fuck you, do you think I'm going to be like, no, wait, let's overcome that. I really want you to fuck. No, I'm not doing that. I would rather be broke than, than, than use these tactics to get people to work with me, you know, or to, or to be with me. Yeah. Then, because it's not going to be what you want it to be. It's going to, it's actually doing you a disservice. Absolutely. You're talking yourself into because you're that desperate part says, I need this for survival. Just everyone say this out loud with me right now. I am not in the business of convincing other people of my worth. Period. Not, that's it. Period. Um, Kristen, what do you have going on? Any group programs coming up or ways people can work with you? Well, the main way I say to work with me is I will have a program starting in the next couple months. It's mm -hmm. not birthed yet, but it's okay. coming, um, is to get on the mailing list for the journal. I have a free journal. So mm -hmm. people are like, where do I start with parentified? I want a journal. It's, it's walk shoots. Every client, it gives you the foundation to begin the work. So you go to Kristen, K R I S T E N D Boyce, B O I C E.com forward slash free resources. You can get the journal for free and reuse it over and over and over to start your journey. And then close the chapter podcast, which you are on. If you want to catch Las of these episode, it got lots of feedback on how empowering people felt after listening to the episode. And I think that's what people are looking for, how to gain the confidence to empower themselves to do this work because it people get scared. And when they go, oh, the freedom and the power that I feel within myself to have more clarity is priceless. So close the chapter podcast. You're going to go to kristendboyce.com. There's tons of episodes on there. I highly recommend the one you are on though. 
Thank you. And I'll make sure I put all of that information in the show notes. Also, everyone, uh, you know that my group program, Say It Out Loud, starts August 5th. What a beautiful container to be able to say how you feel. Talk about these things that Kristen and I were talking about out loud. Love this. I always I always seem to attract women in my life who, you know, it's we always teach what we need to learn, but it's like women who are staying in relationships where they've settled so much. And I'm like, oh, let's get you out of there. You know, let's start healing that relationship with yourself. When you heal that relationship... Unfortunately or fortunately, what happens is you re- like, you know, it's it's sad because this person that you so thought you couldn't live without, you're like, oh, I'm good. And, you know, so it is fortunate because then you open yourself up to someone who really does or who is worthy of you and you are worthy of them. And it works both ways. Um, I want to say this is one of my favorite conversations, you know, uh, as a child that, you know, I this is something my whole life has felt been one of can we just heal can we just say it out loud and fix this um but i and i while i don't provide that type of intense therapy like i used to um i love hearing when other, i love talking to other therapists like y'all are my people we get it we we we, we get the dysfunction so deeply <laughs> that's why we went into therapy we're like let me help you with your shit we get it um this is one of my favorite conversations Kristen. you are so good at um like de-shaming this, right? Because it, it, it can feel very embarrassing to talk about our childhood, especially if you were the parentified child and you were like, you know, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Don't look over here. So thank you for, um, first of all, just talking to me through this. And I know, you know, someone listening, everyone listening, some, definitely more than one person can have benefited from maybe hearing what you had to say. Um, and uh, I just want to say thank you for coming on the show today. And I want to say thank you for being you. You're liberating so many people. And that is priceless. I can't tell you how, how your energy is so freeing to people. And I know you've been told this. So just to be in your presence, I just want to say thank you. And I'm grateful for you. You know what? I, I can always hear it. I can always hear that again. I'm, I'm willing to receive it. And thank you for saying that. I work very... I, I work on my energy. I work on keeping myself feeling um, good about myself, right? Because I'm really no good to anyone when I don't feel good. And I'm here on this earth to do the Lord's work, whatever that looks like for me. So I have to, I get to, and I and I want to keep myself um, to be a clear channel. But yeah, you're amazing to talk to. You were like so fun. Like I usually have a few questions that I ask, but just, I was like, oh no, we gotta, I wanna pick your brain. I'm gonna pick your brain as long as you're, you're brilliant and you're you have such a good, it's like, you know, this stuff can get really emotional. Sorry, y'all. I always say we're going to end the podcast and I just keep talking. But, you know, we, you know, um, this stuff can get very emotional. And what I really appreciate about you is that you do bring uh, logic into it, right? You bring logic into it because when we're so emotionally dysregulated, our our logic goes out the window, right? We're like, I feel this way and I feel like I know I sh- this is not, something's weird, but our body is telling us differently. So just thank you for bringing your approach to the table today. Thank you so much. I'm so hey. grateful. Of course. Thank you for being on the show today. And for everyone listening, uh, love all of you. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Say It Out Loud podcast. And if you like today's episode, please leave a review. Go ahead and check out Kristen. Make sure you get on my book wait list. Check out her free resources. Here to help and serve in any way. Uh, what else do I want to say? Oh, that's it. We're done saying it out loud. I'll catch you next time on another episode of the Say It Out Loud podcast.